Hi, um, good afternoon from Singapore, and I'm not sure if I should say good morning to anyone right here. So good morning and good evening to all of you here. Um, today we will have, uh, I'm Constance from the Observatory of Singapore. I'm a research fellow there, and today I'll be acting as the moderator for Dr. Goswami. So Dr. Prasun Goswami is a marine ecologist as well as an ecotoxicologist based um, in the, at the National Institute of Ocean Technology in India. Um, his research is uh, mainly focused on the effects of human activity and pollution on the aquatic environment. So he has almost 12 years of experience in the field of marine and environmental pollution. And this is also one of the things that he'll be looking at at today's uh, presentation. Uh, over the past five years, uh, Dr. Goswami's research has contributed to the understanding of the hazards that microplastics contamination poses to marine life. So he is currently working on a project that investigates the tropic transfer of microplastics in the marine food web. Uh, Dr. Goswami also did his PhD in marine biology from the University of Madras in 2015. So uh, I'll let him have the floor. And if you have any questions, uh, you can leave it in the chat group, I mean, in the chat box. Uh, we can ask him the questions at the end of his presentation. Or uh, if, you, uh, if you would like, you could also ask him questions um, online, like physically, like, uh, how do I say it? Uh, by turning on your video or like your audio to ask him questions. So let's leave the questions to the end and let um, Dr. Goswami um, have the floor right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Constance, for your excellent uh, introduction. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen first. Okay, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Well, I am Prashant Goswami, currently working at ISA Kolkata. So, my research is focused on marine litter pollution, and today I'm going to enlighten you about marine plastic pollution and how it affects human health. So as you see, plastic is a kind of wonder product. It is in our daily use, uh, right from the time we get up from our bed, and uh, it's, it's there in our cosmetic use, it's there in, uh, in our food packaging that we eat daily. It's, it is there in the furniture, it's there in the transportation system, where, when, wherever we go out. Everywhere you can see the usage of plastic. So the system has been developed in such a way that in some cases we cannot avoid usage of plastics. So the plastic is actually a kind of one of the greatest invention of humankind. But the management of plastic created a lot, uh, lot of issues nowadays uh, in terms of environmental hazard. So if we talk about uh, plastic productions, Right from the beginning, uh, nearly 90% of plastics that get that get uh, dispersed into the environment, or discarded into the environment, and only 9% get recycled. Of course, recycling plastic is not that cost effective, and this also leads to emission of uh, uh, greenhouse gases like carbon and methane. So uh, the problem rises with this 90% of plastics, which, which, which uh, goes to the landfills, to rivers, and ultimately reaches to the ocean, and it interacts with the, uh, both terrestrial and marine organisms. So now, if we see uh, right from the beginning of production of plastic that was way back in 1940s, so humans uh, have almost produced the double the amount of biomass and double the amount of uh, uh, mass that is then the living biomass so as a result plastic has emerged as one of uh, the fifth greatest climate polluters in terms of annual greenhouse emissions 
which also crossed in affecting both terrestrial and marine life. So in the coming slide, you can see our coastal environments nowadays, it is not that pristine. Everywhere you can see plastic and debris like trash and abundant fishing gears. Uh, nowadays, it is mostly visible in the coastal areas and also in the high tide lines. So these are some of the images that, uh, that I had taken in some remote islands of Andaman in India. As you can see, accumulation of plastic bottles, which comes with ocean currents and tides. And you can see a wet pack of uh, discarded television set over here. And uh, the face mask that was uh, found in a beach in Andaman. So, so plastics are everywhere. Now coming to what is microplastics. So basically, uh, microplastics are of two types, the primary one and the secondary one. Primary ones are actually produced in industrial processes. Uh, that is for specific purpose uh, to, to add them in uh, our cosmetics, even toothpaste, or other, other industrial processes like nodules. And whereas when the larger plastic uh, reaches to uh, environment, by due course of time, due to the weathering, so, so, so the larger plastics, uh, once it reaches to the environment, it breaks down into the progressively smaller size of uh, uh, particles, which is below 5 millimeter, that called microplastics. So these microplastics are, are actually vulnerable to the lower food level, uh, lower food chain organisms like zooplankton. What happened actually while in, in the marine environment, zooplankton act as the connecting link in between phytoplankton and fish, so, and they filter out algae from water. In this process, what they do is uh, they accidentally or mistakenly they ingest uh, plastic or microplastic particles. And once inside, it may cause toxic effects. So if you see the uh, global distribution of microplastic in world ocean, you can clearly see over here that uh, microplastic has formed as floating islands, and uh, uh, and uh, these are the these are the gyre systems or accumulating zone where plastics can be found at higher concentrations. So, so the plastic creates a lot of menace in the uh, in the environment not only by accumulating in these areas but also breaking down of larger particle into the smaller particle emits uh, greenhouse gases so that's why plastic is uh, called as the fifth largest climate polluters now if we look into the indian ocean scenarios which is uh, which is uh, which is the regional interest research interest of our research group, you can clearly see the uh, Indian subcontinent areas or even part of African areas uh, can contribute high number of plastics in the coastal areas. Here, the, this panel shows the number of plastic discharge through the riverine inflows, which clearly shows a lot of plastics every year get dumped into Indian Ocean. But if you see this panel, very few observation has been made in the oceanic sector than the coastal sector. So there is a lot of data gap in Indian Ocean to understand what is the fate of microplastics or plastics in these environments. So based on that, what we did was first, we try to understand the fate of microplastic in Indian seas for that, we collected seawater, sediment, zooplankton, fin fish, and selfie samples from the oceanic sectors, and we tried to develop the baseline data. So in our first study, today I'm going to present, we collected water, sediment, and biota samples from coastal areas of Andaman Islands in Port Blair Bay. And what we found was high amount of plastic ingestion in the uh, carnivorous seas 
or even uh, in the commercially important fish that is uh, carangids and we, we detected nearly 67 particles per fish again lower food chain organisms like zooplankton they also showed high amount of microplastic bioaccumulation so we eventually found uh, zooplankton or fish feeding habits can influence microplastic ingestion in this organism that is very alarming in case so then we try to develop the baseline data of microplastic pollution in uh, in indian ocean for this we selected two in two two regional seas that is andaman sea and arabian sea and we collected self sediment from both these seas because uh, sediment act as the ultimate sink of plastic debris so we thought of collecting sediment from these areas and analyze microplastic concentration in it again what we observed was arabian sea tend to accumulate more plastic than the andaman sea and the number was again alarming so then what we wanted to identify was how this plastic interact with the marine organism in the arabian sea for this we collected uh, surface water samples and zooplankton samples of from 26 locations of arabian sea and we analyzed microplastics in it what we observed was all the tested zooplankton groups including copepod ostracods to fish larvae everybody ingested microplastics you can see here some of the zooplankton which ingested microplastics even there were entanglement of microplastic fiber with the observed zooplankton but the interesting fact was fish larvae jellyfish those who tend to be in the higher side of food chain or in the apex sides of food chain planktonic food chain tend to ingest more plastic than the other other zooplankton so this clearly shows feeding habit as well as the trophic status of organism influence microplastic ingestion then we observe polyamide polyethylene polypropylene nylon pet polystyrene and pvc these are some of the major major polluters in these environments so further we we try to understand why the why why plastics why plastic how plastic pollution affect these areas so what we found was interesting fact was the northeastern leaf which pushed coastal plastic from the coastal areas of arabian sea to the central sector of Arab arabian sea so this was clearly evident by this and we also detected uh, the cyclic oceanic gyre system over here which accumulated plastic in this region again the salinity profile clearly showed that the intrusion of low saline bay of bengal water masses to into the bay into the arabian sea can bring a lot of coastal floating microplastics from the eastern coast of india to the western coast so this cycle uh, keeps going on and the plastic eventually start originate from eastern coast ultimately reach to the western coast of india so based on this my understanding once plastic from the land based fluxes reaches to the coastal areas of uh, a coastal environment it starts to interact with marine organisms also by this process throughout its course it absorbs harmful chemicals like uh, trace metals polycyclic polycyclic biphenyls and persistent organic pollutants as well as polyaromatic hydrocarbons all these all these uh, harmful chemicals get absorbed into the plastics and these microplastic act as a concentration of these pollutants and it enter the food chain so it ultimately affect the human through seafood so once plastic in the ocean it may reach up to human via uh, seafood consumption again once plastic in the in reaches in the coastal water it it, it provides a unique niche or unique substrate for microbial growth, which termed as plasticphere. 
these plastic sphere can house millions and billions of bacteria as well as viruses and also has the potential to work as hitchhiker or vector to transfer those viruses or bacteria from one place to another place. This again raises a concern about transmitting disease in the marine environment. So likewise, several research papers nowadays coming up, which shows these mi microplastics can work as a transporting vector or transporting vehicle for these uh, pathogenic bacteria, as well as other, other organisms to the relatively pristine marine environment. Having said that, nowadays due to the propagation of COVID-19, uh, increased usage of face mask and single-use plastics may cause increased problem to the environment as plus as this face mask and single-use plastics all are mostly based on polystyrene or polypropylene. So once discarded, these these uh, face masks can leach chemicals as well as release microplastic fibers which again transfer to the marine food web. Several reports recently suggested that uh, face mask and uh, all other kind of single-use plastic number had been increased post-COVID-19 scenarios. So this was one study take, uh, carried out in the east coast of India in which the author shown uh, the number of plastic is number of plastic found in the beach was increased by nearly 2.6 fold in, in between lockdown and post lockdown area during the COVID-19. Again, there are a lot of uh, literature and also in social media nowadays, you can see so many photographs about the encounter of uh, encounter of uh, marine life as well as terrestrial life, avian life with the plastics. So this clearly shows the usage of uh, improper management of plastic creating a big problem to the environment. So it's not about the environment, even human nowadays is not, it's, it's not safe from plastic pollution. So it was way back in 1998 that uh, microplastic fiber was detected in human lung tissue. And recently, as you can see here, plastic has been detected in uh, human blood, human placenta, embryo, even breast milk, and also in the digestive system. Reports suggest that microplastics can affect human digestion system or human gut microflora, which can cause successive, uh, successive carcinogenic effect in human. So coming to the, coming to the research interest to this uh, our research group so i i, I think uh, this is one of the gray area where we can look into it see uh, the indian ocean specifically the indian subcontinent or even in the southeast asia number of tropical cyclones or extreme weather event increasing alarmingly so uh, this occurrence of uh, tropical cyclone as well as flood events may cause distribution or propagation of plastics as well as microplastics in different marine environment. This was a report taken from Hong Kong where in a, a tropical typhoon that is Mankut typhoon, uh, authors observed increased accumulation of both macro and microplastics in the beach environment. Authors observed nearly 11 fold rise in macro debris, whereas uh, almost doubled numbered microplastic was detected in the marine environment. Uh, and also, the diversity of plastic also increased during the typhoon event. Again, this is a, this is a report from East Coast of India in which authors uh, taken a beach survey and counted number of plastic before and after a neighbor cyclone. And again, they observed nearly three to six fold increase in the number of plastic that were deposited 
in the coastal areas of Kadalo district. So these are the evidences that uh, uh, post cyclonic event, the coastal community or coastal marine uh, uh, food chain may face more or enhanced pollution from plastic. So not only the cyclone, even the coastal floods or even uh, that that 2019 Kerala flood in south south southwest coast of India caused increased number of plastic both in water bottom sediment as well as beach sediment. Again, there are some media reports which suggest nearly around 0.1 million tons of debris, including plastics, were deposited along the Chennai coast in the aftermath of 2015 Chennai flood. So all these reports suggest us that uh, uh, plastic pollution also linked with the extreme weather events. Again, our research group are uh, doing intense research in the Indian mangrove ecosystem of Sundarban, uh, where we frequently find entanglement of plastics even after any cyclonic event. These particular photographs were taken after the recent years and uh, Amphan cyclones. And uh, this was taken from the west coast in Kochi, where, uh, where, uh, where the media report showed that uh, accumulation of plastic immediately after uh, storm surges of cyclonic events. So not only, not only the, the natural calamities, even after the after the cyclone passed by, uh, the immediate requirement of uh, the of uh, relief uh, in terms of giving uh, safe food and uh, drinking water to people may cause additional damage to the environment. As uh, during during the distribution of food packages and uh, uh, and uh, drinking water, the uh, regulation of 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 uh, the trash or the uh, collection of trash does not take place properly, which results in accumulation of plastic debris in the coastal environments. So there are a lot of areas to look, af look after for this uh, plastic research. And uh, nowadays researchers are coming up with remote sensing, artificial intelligence and machine learning to, to, uh, to understand the distribution propagation and the ultimate fate of plastics in the marine environment. In this particular study, uh, remote sensing based on satellite data was used to understand uh, with time scale how plastic moves in the Caribbean Sea. Again, uh, this is the research from a research group from Greece where they have developed a, 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 developed a marine debris database based on Sentinel-2 remote sensing satellite. So the idea is uh, our research group have, have enough expertise to look, look into these gray areas where much work has not been done in the uh, Southeast Asian countries. So previous, most of the work have been carried out in the Western countries, but in the Southeast Asia, which is actually uh, the hotspot of plastic pollution, I could not find much research done so far. So this is a really a interesting area. I think our group can collaborate and work together. So these are some of the glimpses that author has shown how machine, line, machine learning tools can be used to, to classify debris in the marine environment. So if we have more information based on remote sensing, so it will be easy to it will be easy to conduct the, uh, the uh, ocean cleanup or beach cleanup, and we we can stop distribution of plastics during the uh, during the flood events or even during the uh, during the cyclonic storms. So based on that, my take home messages will be: uh, as of now, plus marine plastic research is going on like plastic is everywhere, but we do not know what is the effect of it and what is the ultimate fate of plastics in the environment. And so if reaches in the environment, 
So what we can do with that? And we have to think beyond our capacity to collaborate between biology and physics and chemistry and all other uh, kind of scientific stream and to, and, to and to check the challenges of BCC. With this, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you. And I'm open for any questions. Sorry. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Goswami. Thank you. Yeah, um, I see that there's a question on the chat group by um, Professor Bongolan. Um, she asked, what are the possible solutions? Um, everyone seems to be monitoring it. Is, there, is anyone looking for a solution? Uh, yeah, actually nowadays uh, research is moving towards uh, developing possible solution. So we, first of all, uh, we cannot, we cannot uh, totally stop plastic usage in our life. So what we can do is to reduce the usage and uh, we, we, we need to look forward to, to develop sustainable technologies to, to, make, uh, to make more cost-effective bioplastics and also uh, to, to, to check the uh, possibilities for alternative packaging. Uh, maybe that is the way we can reduce the usage of plastics and also we need to we we need to uh, do strict regulations about uh, improper waste disposal so waste collection has to be done in proper way to reduce the uh, dumping of plastics in the marine environment okay uh, i think uh, let me just continue with um, Professor Bongolan's uh, questions. What about the plastic that is already in the oceans? Can we not do anything about that? Yeah, once plastic reaches the ocean, it is very difficult to recover. And uh, of course, there are works going on by ocean cleanup teams where they mostly recover the macroplastics or larger debris, but once it is in micro scale, it is very difficult to remove from the sea. Even our wastewater treatment plants are incapable enough to filter out plastics from the wastewater. So it's, it's, it's better to stop it at its uh, first point to enter into the ocean. Okay, um, so Professor Bongola, I hope that answers your question. There's another question from Dr. Pham. Thanks, Dr. Goswami, for the very interesting talk. I'd like to know whether microplastic can change or alter chemical properties of seawater. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, there are reports that uh, plastics, once comes were in contact with seawater, leaches chemical in it. Uh, the additives what it's present in, in, in plastics may leach out into the seawater. Also, uh, uh, recent, re recent researches suggest that plastic uh, release DOC, that is dissolved organic carbon, once it comes in contact with seawater. Yeah. Okay, is there anyone who would like to ask the question like, um... You can turn on your mic or raise your hand. I'll try to see if, yeah, I could get a question from you. Oh, there's one by, mm, it's a very difficult Chinese word for me to read. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying. Li Ling Ti Oh, yeah, could you, yeah, could you uh, just speak out your question? Okay, uh, Professor, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Okay. So, good afternoon, Professor. So, I have uh, one question. It's uh, because we know in oceans, there's uh, something called the zooplankton. So, they have day night cycle. So, in the day, they will be stay in the deep water, and the night, they will be stay in the shallow water. And this kind of day night cycle will be required this kind of zooplankton to regulatory their self the buoyancy. So to change their uh, depth. 
So my question is uh, just like your slideshow. So something uh, zoo point on there itself will have something like microplastic. And different type of microplastic has a different volumes. Like for example, the polypropylene, there will be their density is lower than water. So yeah. different polypropylene, they are heavier than water. So my yeah. question is uh, if uh, zoo point on it eats different type of the microplastic, Will make will they make this kind of zooplankton will difficult to control their self the buoyancy and to destroy their data cycle, especially in something area like the Pacific Rim garbage patch. So this is uh, my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting question. Uh, actually, as you as you know, zooplankton have the vertical migration uh, characteristics. So what they do is they mostly come up during the night time to to graze or to or, or to feed uh, during their feeding time there is uh, evidences even in our research what we found was uh, zooplankton tend to ingest plastics accidentally but in the same work I, I i didn't show the data over here we could not find any difference between the num uh, the plastic that ingested during the daytime or the plastic that ingested during the night time. What we thought because once ingested, it is difficult to digest or zooplankton cannot digest plastics. And it takes time to come out from zooplankton by their feces or whatever it is. So this is one part. The zooplankton takes time to remove plastic. So they stop feeding. This is one part. And the sick, uh, coming to the buoyancy or the density of plastics, so if, consider if it is a lighter plastic like polyethylene, if zooplankton ingest a uh, smaller particle of polyethylene which is uh, lighter than seawater, what happens is it changes the buoyancy of the fecal matter of zooplankton. So it eventually reduces the sinking speed of uh, fecal matter. As, as we all know, the zooplankton faces or fecal matter act as, act as a transport vehicle for the, for the carbon to, to, to settle into the ocean bottom. So if we modify the density of fecal matter, it eventually reduces the amount of carbon that gets transported to the ocean bottom. This is, one, one, this is uh, the second part of your question. And the third part is uh, about the about the density, right, of these plastic particles, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you see, uh, once plastic reaches to ocean by aging process or by like uh, uh, like biofilm formation, uh, the density increases with time. So once it is in the surface, eventually. Uh, most of the plastic go to the ocean bottom. So it is not about the density alone, it is also about the time frame what you are talking about. The, the, uh, the oldest the plastic, it is having the highest chance to reach to the ocean bottom. Yeah, okay. I think I can clear. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goswami, there's one more question from Dr. Fan. Uh, with the development of remote sensing tech and machine learning, Mirada showed in your talk, what do you think about a monitoring system for marine plastic pollution at coastal regions? Yeah, thank you for these interesting questions. Actually, uh, machine learning is uh, gradually but steadily coming up in this research field. And I, I strongly believe that uh, that in situ monitoring is important, but it is difficult if we talk about long or vast coastline, or if we need to do monitoring on a on a quick scale, because uh, in situ monitoring takes a lot of time. You need to go over there in the sea, collect the samples, analyze and analyze the spectra, analyze the data. So it takes a lot of time. So I think remote sensing has the power if we develop this technique and if we increase the accuracy remote sensing coupled with machine learning 
can be a game changer in this uh, plastic monitoring since uh, monitoring is very important to develop policy so without monitoring and without proper data scientific data we cannot uh, develop scientific policies to manage plastics yeah okay uh, all right so it appears that you did manage to answer uh, dr fam's question he said thanks a lot um, uh, thank you is the there question. anyone else who would like to go oh, like who would like to give a question to dr goswami you can raise your hand and then yeah if not, actually, I do have a question um, following what Dr. Pham has asked. Um, yeah. Just to ask if you have a monitoring system, how would it work? Because I am assuming that the ocean currents do bring the microplastics around, yes. but yes. It, it takes a long time for it to cycle back to where it started. So what you are getting, let's just say, at the Indian coasts may not be from India itself. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so if you want to implement a policy, sometimes I think it's very hard to justify if people do know about that. Like, oh, it's not from our coast, then why should yeah, they yeah, be, yeah. like, you know, doing something about it? It's not our yes. fault, so it's a bit yes. hard. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, if you see the macroplastic, sometimes you can see the information about the packaging or hmm. the manufacturing date or the country of origin but if we talk about microplastics it is impossible to, uh, to tell about the source so yeah. we only can talk about source based upon the plastic types like okay. uh, different polymers like polyamide if you talk about that mostly comes from textile industry and if we talk about nylon that comes from the fishing industry so this way we can categorize plastics and we can talk about the source but coming to the coming to the point where the origin of uh, plastics, I think uh, plastic is not a regional problem. It's a global or transboundary problem. So the challenge is big. So that is why it is very important to work together in between countries and uh, and to try to solve this issue. It is not a, even a, one single country's uh, problem. And also uh, there is a practice in the in the developed nations that they, 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 instead of doing incineration or instead of recycling plastic, they simply export plastic to the uh, third world countries or least developed countries or least developed economies in, in Africa or so even in some of the Southeast Asia. So, uh, so this way we cannot, we cannot uh, reduce plastic or we cannot remove plastic from our planet. We cannot, we cannot uh, control plastics. Uh, Professor E, could you repeat your question? Uh, I think he couldn't hear you the first time. Okay, around. the question was that um, one time I heard that the, the Indian Ocean or some other oceans sometimes mm -hmm. find that a large area uh, mm -hmm. was covered by uh, by bacteria or virus. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they just go from place to places, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, as, I, as I shown in, in some of my slides, that these plastics can work as transporting vector of this virus or bacteria because in ocean there is no solid substrate so plastic actually nowadays work as a solid substrate for this bacteria or viruses to concentrate or to grow on it so uh, the, the plasticsphere community which grows on plastic can transfer from uh, one area to another by means of ocean currents or tides or wind also. So this is one of the greatest challenge nowadays uh, humankind is facing. Also the transferring of antibiotic resistant genes to plastics nowadays coming up in literature. So I hope I could answer you, Professor. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any more questions from the audience? Um, I don't if think not, there maybe are. I should, I should announce that the next talk uh, in September will be given by by Constance herself. Um, I, it, it, what's the title? I think the exact title is um, uh, understanding. Right? Yeah, understanding. 
the impacts of tsunami on coastal infrastructure. I think so. I forgot myself. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, yeah. we just received the abstract from her yesterday and we will put it up in the announcement. So please look at it uh, every, uh, and, and watching for her talk. That will be one month from now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but thank you so much, um, Dr. Goswami, for your presentation. It was really a great one. Yes. I'm so sorry that I interrupted you halfway. Yeah, no, 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 no problem. So I also congratulate you for serving oh. as moderator. And I also <laughs> okay. look forward for the next talk. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Aiki. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Vipo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Okay, bye bye. bye, -bye. Oh, thank you.